Our next speaker is Fayed Ahmad. She's an assistant professor of psychology at the University of Maine and the director of the Maine Health, Aging, and Lifestyle Lab, which if I remember right, has been going on for 25, 30 years? Nope, I started it when I got here. You started it. Oh, I'm totally wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. Even better. She's a founder. Like, it's I'm better. I was thinking about uh, Maine Syracuse longitudinal study because I'm involved with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. She'll explain later. Okay. Uh, after earning her PhD from the University of Georgia, Fieza completed her pre-doctoral internship at the VA Maryland Healthcare Center, University of Maryland Medical School Consortium. See how she, she this is, this is, so I, have to, I have to, say I the have to read I this know. because it's ridiculous in a good way. She completed two postdoctoral fellowships, one at Cornell Medical College's Memory Disorders Program and the other at Puget Sound VA Healthcare Systems Neurocognitive Disorders Across the Lifespan Program. The reason why I say it's ridiculous in, in all of these ways is psychology is half, or psychiatrists, psych, psychology. Mm -hmm. psychology. The stuff you guys have to do to get to the next level is crazy. Like, I thought physics was bad, but you guys have so many things to answer for. I know, I mean that, I just, okay, I'll stop. Um, Fayette's training is primarily in clinical neuropsychology, the study of brain behavior relationships as it applies to neurologic and psychiatric disorders. Prior to becoming a professor, the majority of her clinical work was in diagnosis and mo monitoring progress of dementias, such as Alzheimer's disease. Her research at UMaine focuses on health behaviors and factors that impact risk for dementia, such as Alzheimer's, earlier in the lifespan. So the pop culture item, this just warmed my heart, <laughs> the magic school bus, yeah. um, which, which uh, you said you still watch to relax, do, fall which is really it. great. Yeah. So, and Fiesa uh, is going to talk about what can I do about my risk for Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And then just some. You there. There awesome. You I'm gonna keep an eye on the time. I might be your first, okay, I might be your first cowbell. I've been practicing, but I'm not sure. Okay. Well, thank you everyone. So um, before we get started, the first thing I wanted to talk about was a little bit of terminology. Um, you may have heard of dementia and Alzheimer's disease used pretty interchangeably. Um, so when we talk about dementia, what we're referring to is a group of diseases that are referred to as neurodegenerative, meaning that it's not something you're born with, but over time, this disease process is causing a loss of brain cells. And as a result of that loss of brain cells, we start to experience significant declines in our cognitive abilities, which are our thinking skills like memory, language, attention, and so on, to the point where eventually those thinking changes um, interfere with our ability to take care of ourselves. So that large umbrella term is referred to as dementia, and there's a variety of different disease processes that can cause dementia, such as Parkinson's disease, dementia, HIV-associated neurocognitive disease, and so on. Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia, and the majority of individuals with dementia would likely have Alzheimer's disease, which is probably why you hear the two terms interchangeably. Um, but Alzheimer's disease is characterized by a particular um, classic set of symptoms that begin first because of the particular areas of the brain that are affected first. You might also be wondering why a psychologist is telling you about all this. And so um, as a neuropsychology, um, uh, especially uh, training in, in neuropsychology, what we would do is um, diagnose or monitor progress over time by going through medical records, going through neuroimaging records, uh, labs, um, and then going through standardized testing of all these different cognitive functions. And right now, what we know is that, um, although Anne, I think, is changed, hopefully going to change this, is that the best way to diagnose still is through clinical assessment and clinical neuropsychological assessment. All right. So, but that's not the purpose of the talk. So the unfortunate part, um, also as, as Anne mentioned, this really helped me out with my time today, <laughs> is that we don't have a cure for Alzheimer's disease. The medications that we do have that are FDA approved can mask symptoms at most, um, but it doesn't really change the disease process, unfortunately. Um, what we do know is that by the time we start to see the symptoms we think of with Alzheimer's, you know, getting lost, um, having profound memory changes, by then, the disease process has been going on for quite some time. And um, even before MCI, as we were saying, the, the literature is actually showing that at the, at the level of our brain, we're getting subtle changes as many as decades earlier. And so what we're really finding is that waiting until the disease is, is visibly a, uh, present is, is kind of too late. Um, that doesn't mean that people can't still do things to prolong their, their, their lifespan while they have Alzheimer's disease. But in terms of trying to stop or delay the progression, 
And that's kind of where the research is right now. And so people focus on uh, modifiable risk factors. What can we do to, if we don't know how to prevent it, how can we at least delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease? And so these are things like, um, that you may have heard of, like doing cognitively stimulating games, things that use your brain, things that are exciting, things that are fun, that have social engagement up there, because it, not only does it help with your mood, but it's a very cognitively demanding task to have a socially appropriate conversation with another individual. Right? Um, and then, although we don't have time for this, the, um, the effects of SES-related things like years of education and what that affords an individual in terms of the type of job they can get and you know, whether it's a more cognitively demanding job, the type of nutrition, all of those things are related to our brain health. Um, the thing that I have listed in, in the bigger box here, what's good for the heart is good for the brain, um, a lot of our research has really shown that whenever we're following heart-healthy lifestyle um, behaviors, we're also protecting our brain, right? So at the level of our heart, we're talking about our cardiovascular system. At the level of our brain, we're talking about cerebrovascular. So a heart-healthy diet helps prevent heart attack and stroke. But you might wonder, well, what does this have to do with Alzheimer's disease? Right? I get it. Stroke, I understand. But what about AD? Oh, shit. Okay. So, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, what we do know is that blood supply, um, the blood supply system does become inefficient very early on in the disease. And in fact, um, a lot of research has shown that it's shown up before you see other hallmark symptoms of the disease. Some of the work that we're doing in our lab is looking at the efficiency of our, our blood, um, blood supply system. And we find that in Alzheimer's disease, it can actually change way before you see any of the symptoms there. Okay, I'm gonna skip some of these here. So you might say, well, gosh, you told me a lot of different things like heart healthy diet, exercise this many minutes, don't have, you know, don't smoke, high cholesterol, all these things, what should I do first? What we know is that we wanna keep things simple. And if anybody's trying to make a lifestyle change, you wanna take the thing that is the easiest to do first. The rest start to combine, they start to pile on top of each other. And what we know is that we can reduce up to 40% of new dementia cases with- Oh, so close, so close! Ah. <laughs> I also forgot to say my mic off. I'm sure there's questions. Sorry, no, yes, no. Oh, coming up. All right. So you stick teaching gonna, in this. I'm going to be that person. You were saying we can reduce up to 40 percent. What was the rest of that? <laughs> <sentence>? Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so these guidelines are from like World Health Organization, Alzheimer's Association, and so on. And the Lancet Commission recently came out saying that as many as as high as 40 percent of new dementia cases broadly could be at least delayed. They, they can't really say prevented with the implementation of these kinds of lifestyle changes. But that includes things like stroke related, vascular. Yeah. And I did have a question about one of the slides. You said it said physical activity, not just exercise. Ah, yes. BRB. So, yeah, I'm actually writing a paper on this right now. I think a lot of times when we think of um, exercise, we think, oh, we need to get on a treadmill. We need to go to the gym. We need to do one of only few things. And if you didn't have a good experience with exercise earlier, it can kind of put people off. And so we talk about there's anything that's physical activity that gets your heart rate up is good for you. So things like gardening or mowing the lawn, things that maybe you might not do intentionally with the, with the goal of physical fitness is still physical activity that's good for your, your body and your brain. Yeah, great question, thanks. Are there any... Um monitoring systems that we elder warriors can plug into to maybe pick up any early warning signals? Are there any structures in place like that? Oh, that that's could a be great helpful? question. Um, I don't know of any technology that would kind of pick up right now if somebody's experiencing early cognitive change, although that is an area that's growing. Um, really, what the, the best thing to do if somebody has any kind of concern about possibly having a dementia is to first talk to their primary care provider. And if it's a concern that they think, yeah, we really need to, need to get you a more thorough evaluation, then they'll refer to a neuropsychologist usually for evaluation. But there are so many things that affect our, um, that affect our, our brain, right? So when we're not getting enough sleep, when we're really stressed, when we've um, experienced a major life stressor like the loss of a loved one, all of these things, it's severe depression can really mimic dementia. We even use the term pseudo-dementia 
to describe individuals who've had depression that, are, that is so severe that it's starting to look like that because it affects your concentration, which is going to affect memory down the road. Yeah, great question. In your case, Roger, I, I'm guessing it's your wife that would be the best early warning system. Uh, I think they're recording this. Is there anything? <laughs> Is there, any, is there anything specific to the way that blood flow is to the brain starts to change that could be used mm -hmm. as an early dementia signaling method? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is it easily, like, are you able to easily say, oh, the blood flow of the brain has been affected? Or is it like more of a post-mortem, like, oh, this person's not got a lot of blood vessels here, here, right. and here? Right. No, that's a, that's a great question. Um, Almost like you knew that I just wrote a grant about this. Uh, so, <laughs> what we know is that really early on, there was a, a Nature paper that published in 2020 um, where they actually saw degeneration of the blood-brain barrier way before you saw the other hallmark subtle changes of Alzheimer's disease, which is happening decades before you see those cognitive symptoms. So we already know that things that it's um, it's disintegrating pretty early on, meaning that other toxins are able to get in. The work that I'm doing right now is looking at basically kind of like a stress test for the brain. So before you start to see structural changes that said, oh, over a long time, this is the damage that's accumulated, what if you were to tax that brain, right? Like a, like a stress test, make you do something that would make your vessels dilate, but then constrict back appropriately. Um, there's not too much research in the area. My, my lab's the only one that has that um, uh, device, but uh, at least at, at, at UMaine, not in the world. Uh, but there's some evidence to suggest that early, early on, individuals who might be at risk for Alzheimer's disease already start to show some inefficiencies. And so really the goal is to try to target those individuals who are most vulnerable, um, because it's even more important for them to engage in some of these changes in behaviors earlier in their lifespan. And I also want to emphasize that it's never too late to get started on any of these things. Yeah, thanks. Um, can you speak to any correlation between sugar and the blood-brain barrier? Or oh, absolutely. So there's a lot of research with type 2 diabetes being uh, an increased risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, um, there's some really great research that came out of um, Seattle, but also now Wake Forest University, um, where they're looking at it, where they look at insulin insensitivity. So even individuals who may be pre-diabetic will already start to have some glucose insensitivity in, in their brain meaning that you know, glucose is one of the right, uh, energy sources for the brain. And we're already finding that with type 2 diabetes, our brain moves, as, as with the rest of the body. Mm. <laughs> okay, so close. <laughs> Thank you.